William Tustar. Wonderful day indeed. In fact, I'm prepared to break out in a song. It's such a wonderful day. If you were to sing a song, and I'm not saying that you would, nor would I let you, what song would that be? I'm glad you would not let me because that's the best thing. Well, you know, I have creative control of the show. <laughs> yeah. In other words, about, I control the microphone. Uh, with my air, how about You Are My Sunshine? Would that fly? I think you could. You could uh, I'm not saying you could sing that song. I'm saying that if you were to sing a song, that would be a good one for your air. <laughs> yeah, for my air, yeah. yeah I, Actually, that was a little bit before my air. So. I don't think you should sing a song. Uh, I, I agree. If you've heard me sing, you'd, you'd understand why. I so. would pay to hear you speak French, though. That's the thing that I've always come back to when you told us that you took French lessons and the French instructor eventually just quit. Yeah, well, actually said, <laughs> Mr. Stubblefield, we're wasting your money and wasting my time. <laughs> so. Give me a give me a little parlez-vous français. What do you remember from that? Parlez-vous français. <laughs> that sounds like Gomer Pyle doing a little French accent there. <laughs> That's good stuff. You want to hear my my song, my singing? No, uh, I told you I don't want to. No, hear no, no I'm not I'm not going to sing. But a quick story. Uh, I was uh, in church choir as a young kid, and mm -hmm. we did had a good choir, and we went through competition and got to one of the more serious uh, uh, competition stage, and the choir director went up to my cousin who had a very good voice and asked him to sing very loud that night so no so nobody could hear me <laughs> it's, it was devastating in my confidence that's uh that's those cruel times back then bill they didn't, <laughs> they didn't spare the feelings of young that's people exactly right when the competition is all that counted you got it straight <laughs> when they when they had an opinion you got it straight and it it uh was such a stigma to me i've never tried to sing since i have tried to sing but everybody around me asked me to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if Glenn Ellie can sing or not. Let's uh, let's find out here. He's a candidate for U.S. Senate. His opponent will be Jim Justice in the general coming up in November. Glenn, good morning. How are you, sir? I am doing great, Robin. You do not want to hear me sing. All right, we're all in the same boat then. <laughs> Did you have a similar experience in church choir when you were 9 to 10 years of age, Glenn? I, I can go on better than that. Uh, but when I was in college, I actually was in a band. Um, this was in the early 1990s, and... Uh, my bandmates made sure to keep me uh, uh, positioned anywhere uh, as far as possible from the microphones, as you can imagine. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, think, I think we're kind of all in the same boat there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you mentioned college. I'm going to add one more quick story in my singing. I was, uh, Do you really need to do this? Yes, thing? I am, Rob. I, you got me started. <laughs> In, uh, in, in college, uh, the fraternities had required uh, all sing. There was a lot mm -hmm. of competition. I was the only one in my fraternity that was not required to sing. In <laughs> fact, they asked Jeez. me not to participate. People were cruel to you. They really were. They really were, yes. It's amazing you've turned out to be the confident young man you are today, Bill. <laughs> well, the confidence does not extend to singing or to French. <laughs> Either one. As Clint Eastwood said, man's got to know his limitations, <laughs> right? right. Uh, Glenn, we've had you on the program several times, but uh, the audience is always turning over, and uh, you always have new people who are moving into the area here or listening for the first time. Give us a couple of minutes in, in uh, review of the Glenn Elliott story to this point. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, I am um, a born and raised in Wheeling in the northern panhandle. You know, we're, also, well, we're in that other panhandle that sometimes feels a little bit forgotten in West Virginia. Uh, born and raised in Wheeling, went to, I went away to college because I really didn't see a future in uh, West Virginia. Uh, you know, Wheeling was contracting at the time, losing a lot of its population uh, with the steel mills uh, closing uh, back in the 1980s, 1990s. Went to college, uh, but then kind of stumbled upon an internship with Senator Byrd, and then that became my first uh, job. I, when I graduated college, I moved to D.C., worked for him for five years in his office, and that sort of changed the trajectory of, uh, you know, what I thought I wanted to do. I, I, at his suggestion, went to law school at Georgetown and um, and then stumbled my way. Um, uh, you know, didn't really, um, um, instead of going back to Capitol Hill like I should have after law school, I went to work at a law firm because I was in a lot of debt from student loan debt, and um, I didn't like that. So I did that for about eight years. Um, at the age of 38, I kind of walked away from the career in law, moved back to Wheeling to figure things out, and I uh, was glad I did because I got involved in so much going on here in the community trying to bring it back. Um, ended up buying an old building in downtown Wheeling, and um, uh, um, that, that got me a, snow, a snow notoriety. I decided to run for mayor in 2016 uh, with really little name recognition, won that race pretty soundly, won again in 2020, and uh, was really planning to step away from politics. Um, I have a, a young son, and now we have a daughter on the way. Um, but 
um, when Senator Manchin got out of this uh, Senate race, I gave it a lot of thought because I had worked in the Senate for Byrd. I'd seen what this seat can do, uh, how important the seat is for West Virginia. I've worked with Senator Manchin a lot uh, during my time as mayor, and seen how he, uh, see, I've seen how he has been able to help uh, cities across the state, and really felt like I was a, a good fit for it. I recognized the politics of the state. I recognized that people, uh, you know, uh, going into this race, say you have no chance. Uh, but I knew going into it that if I won my primary, which I did, I'd be facing a, a, a candidate who, uh, though widely popular in West Virginia, is also widely flawed. And I think Governor Justice, in the last couple of months of news coverage, has been proving the latter in that regard. So I do think this race is a much more winnable than a lot of folks would suggest. And I'm doing everything I can uh, to get my message out. We just finished up a 55-county tour yesterday. We started in Welch on Labor Day down in McDowell County, and we finished in Hancock County in Weirton last night. Uh, 55 counties, a little over nine weeks. I've been to more counties in nine weeks than the governor's been to in eight years. So, um, you know, I'm proud of the effort, and, you know, we're just really getting started. Uh, we got, uh, what, 60, I think, seven days to go. Uh, we are going pedal to the metal uh, to win this thing. Glenn, congratulations on the uh, daughter on the way. Well, thank you. Way. Yeah. yeah. When are you, when are you expecting? Actually, on Thanksgiving, so it's going to be a an impactful November for sure. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I'm not winning the husband or father of the year award this year by leaving a pregnant wife with a toddler at home to to go all over the state campaigning. But in my defense, when I uh, before I got into this race, I asked my wife, um, you know, if she wants me to do it or not, because I recognize all the challenges let alone of, of being pregnant, but having a toddler at home. And she wanted me to do it because she knows how, how much the state means to me and how much pu- a public service has meant to me. And uh, so she is doing a great job keeping things going here back in Wheeling. But the, which, oh, I actually am in Wheeling today, which is rare because uh, I've been so much uh, I, I, over the last few weeks. I've been everywhere but Wheeling. Uh, but I'm in Wheeling this weekend, and then we're going to really hit the road on Monday. You mentioned uh, Governor Justice, and certainly there's been an awful lot of news about his finances over the last couple of weeks that have come out. Do you feel that he is more beatable now than he might have been two weeks ago or a month ago, more vulnerable now? Well, how can you not feel that way? I mean, look, I mean, I think people had baked in the fact that he just doesn't pay taxes on time, doesn't pay his creditors. That was all kind of there. Uh, The news coming out about him taking health insurance premium money and and whatever – Whatever shell game he's involved in, you know, shifting money to pay for whatever the, uh, you know, whatever the dumpster fire is of that day, uh, but taking people's actual employees' insurance money um, that was never his to begin with, uh, just like the sales tax money he's taken is never his to begin with, and using it for something else, I think is really rubbing people the wrong way. And you know, uh, uh, Rob, what really gives me a lot of hope is is spending time with uh, people down south that know him better than maybe the rest of the state. You know, I was just in Lewisburg, and we had 140 people show up for a town hall on a hot August day. Um, And they did so because they know Jim Justice better than any of us, and they don't like him. And my challenge, actually, is getting people uh, from the rest of the state to understand who he really is, not the guy who shows up with the dog and with the all shuckses, but the guy who really doesn't uh, play by by the rules that the rest of us do, the guy who doesn't show up to work, most importantly, if I learned anything working for Byrd and working with Senator Manchin, is you can't be an effective senator uh, from your living room in Lewisburg. You have to show up. You have to be willing to work. And I just don't see that work after their uh, commitment from him. He, uh, he said the other day that uh, he's not going to win attendance records if he's elected to the Senate. He said before that not a fiber in his being wants to go to D.C. Well, I believe him in those respects. Uh, but West Virginia, uh, you know, we've been spoiled with this particular Senate seat for 65 years, having people who have shown up to work and who did want to be there, I think West Virginians need to think long and hard about sending someone there who really doesn't want to go in the first place. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Glenn. Uh, you're, you're touching on something I was going to ask, ask about. Uh, when you are here last time, you gave a very compelling argument about engagement, the success sure. that we in West Virginia have had because our senators have been engaged. Uh, I gather that's been a central theme as you travel in all 55 states. Is that, is that correct? Uh, 100%, Bill. Um, Look, the way you're an effective senator is different than being an effective governor. The way you're an effective senator is you have to build relationships. You have to, uh, you know, show up to work and actually work across the aisle. Um, You have to put your head down, really, as a freshman senator. It's... it's, uh, uh, the Senate is a chamber with a lot of egos, and they don't like freshman senators coming in thinking that they're, you know, uh, the hottest deal in town. So you got to put your head down, do uh, do uh, do the work. Ideally, be there long enough to build some seniority uh, to where you can start bringing back 
uh, resources to your state. Uh, the governor hasn't taken the time to build relationships in the legislature, even in his own. Uh, uh, he has a supermajority of his own party, and he couldn't get them to pass an extended tax cut. Uh, that tells you just you know how ineffective he's been, uh, let alone working with the Democrats. He doesn't even acknowledge they exist. Um, you know, I look at Senator Manchin. You know, he has built relationships on both sides of the aisle in. Uh, in the Senate, and you know that has paid dividends, uh, just like Senator Byrd did. It, oh, when I worked for Senator Byrd, his best friends were uh, not really politically lined with him. His best two, uh, two friends that I recall were Senator Ted Kennedy on the left and Senator Ted Stevens on the right. Uh, but he uh, leveraged relationships across the aisle and across his own political spectrum uh, to get stuff done, and that's just something I don't see from Governor Justice. You know, like I said, when you're the governor of a uh, of a supermajority Republican uh, uh, legislature, and you can't get them to pass a tax cut, maybe you're just not that good at politics. Uh, Glenn, uh, you mentioned earlier that you felt the race is going to be closer than what many folks would think it would be. Yep. Uh, there's two ways to gauge, at least from my perspective, uh, the tightness of race. One would be the polls, sure. and the second one would be the dollars that go into the respective campaigns. Yep. Uh, I've not seen poll numbers that give you a sense of optimism, nor have I seen dollars from on either side. I've not seen a lot of dollars going to your campaign uh, from the PACs, nor have I've seen a lot of dollars going in the justice campaign, which makes me think that the folks with the dollars feeling that justice is going to win. Where, what am I reading yeah. wrong here? Uh, well, you're right on, on the polling. Uh, there is some polling, I believe, is going to be taking place soon uh, uh, because we need uh, – part of the argument we need to make to those folks who sit on the sidelines watching this race is, is that it's closing. And there will be some polling coming out here soon. Uh, stay tuned on that. We know we started way down. We know we're still down, but at the same time, uh, we know the trend lines are moving in a positive direction. In terms of money, uh, look, it – it's a tough year for any Democrat in West Virginia to raise money, but I've raised more than all the other Democratic statewide candidates uh, combined. We've raised about 460, 470,000 so far, which is not enough. I'll be the first to admit. Uh, but we've been making the case to the um, uh, uh, the National Party uh, that they need to look at this race for a couple reasons. You know, the National Party has their sights on taking out some people like Ted Cruz in Texas, which which those of us on the Democratic side would probably agree with. Ted Cruz. Uh, does not represent my values, uh, but Ted Cruz is a very good campaigner. He's in a very big state. Uh, he's a very good debater, and he's going to raise a heck of a lot of money. And you could spend forty million dollars going after Ted Cruz in Texas, or you could spend a couple million in West Virginia and dramatically change the shape of this race. We've been trying to make that case. You know, I was just at the convention in Chicago and made that case to uh, some of the folks who can do something about it. You know, I know now that they're looking at this race in ways they hadn't. Uh, you know, all I had to do was really just give them a list of of new stories regarding the governor. Uh, when you see someone uh, so damaged and so flawed, if you put him in any other state, uh, he's down 10, 20 points with all these issues. It's only because of West Virginia that it's, close, it, it, it's a race where he's up. Uh, but he is the most flawed Senate candidate of, uh, in the country, as far as I can look at it. Um, you know, with all these issues, you know, uh, playing by different sets of rules than the rest of us, you know, that's just not something that voters are going to respect. I recognize um, it's easy to say, well, this is a Republican state. I think this is a state that's that's you know is definitely strongly uh, attached to the former president. I think President Trump's going to win this state by thirty or thirty five points. I don't think there's any argument on that one. Uh, but for some of these down ballot uh, down ballot races, people are going to look at character and people are going to look at you know work ethic. And I think it's a mistake to just assume that because uh, Trump's going to win the state by a lot, uh, that all the other Republicans running for statewide office are going to have the same result. You know, voters across West Virginia are smarter than that, and I think they're going to look at uh, a, a lot of different things. And I think, regardless of party, I know Republicans who just don't like the fact that the governor doesn't play by the rules uh, of of the game. And I think that's something that doesn't sit well with people. So a lot of people, uh, folks may either not vote, they may not vote for me, but they also may not vote for him in that race. And I think if we can get Democratic votes out, uh, Democrats... Uh, Democrats were kind of suppressed. They weren't that enthusiastic about former President Biden. Or, I'm sorry, about current President Biden. If we can get the Democrats out now, there's some new excitement with the new ticket. Um, you know, that's something. I think this race is much closer uh, than uh, conventional wisdom suggests. And uh, you know, I'm going to keep fighting like we're going to win this, and we'll see. The uh, the other aspect, I'm going to stand on the money for a couple of minutes, is that I do not see any money going into the justice race yeah. uh, from the uh, Republican PACs, which implies to me that the uh, Republicans are fairly confident it's going to be that justice is going to win. Uh, you see anything to the contrary of that? 
And that, that sounds right. Look, it's clear to me going into this that the Republicans are not do not consider West Virginia a state they have to fight to uh, pick up that seat. That, uh, they consider it a foregone conclusion, and I'm glad they consider it that way, uh, because I don't think a lot of the news of this stuff about Governor Justice ha- ha- has really filtered up to the national levels yet. Uh, what I can tell you is that I made a pretty solid case uh, when meeting with folks in, in Chicago uh, that it would be a big mistake not to actually spend some time and energy looking at this race and looking at just how flawed the governor is. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen between now and Election Day, but we know his business empire is really uh, looks more and more like a house of cards. We know that he's taken money that doesn't belong to him and used it to pay other debts. Um, you know, we, oh, we know that – or, uh, you know, he blames Democrats for this all, all being some political hit – uh, but, you know, name me another business owner who doesn't actually turn over his sales tax, who's allowed to keep a liquor license and or a lottery license like the governor has been. Uh, he has benefited from incumbency and from his position of power uh, in a way that a lot of business owners wouldn't. And that just doesn't sit well with people. And, you know, I think, uh, look, it's on us to remind more and more voters of ac- exactly who he is. Like I said, the people in Lewisburg know it. It's the rest of the state where we, where we have our work cut out for us. We have to get more people to know who I am. And we have to get more people to know exactly who he is, and it's not the guy who shows up with the dog and the check to hand out. You you made a very interesting point about Ted Cruz uh, a few minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about Rick Scott? Would the same argument be made for Rick Scott? A similar argument, yes. I mean, Florida and Texas, I mean, I know Democrats uh, would love to uh, pick up Senate seats there as well, but, you know, those states have been, um, you know, uh, it, in both cases you have – I. Uh, senators Rick Scott and uh, and Ted Cruz, who are really good at the art of politics. They're really good at raising money. Uh, they're really good on TV. Uh, they're just. Uh, I, they I know Democrats would like to take them out because they don't like them and they don't agree with their policies and they want to pick up those states. But you're dealing with states with huge media markets where where to make a big dent. In, in the conversation, you have to spend, you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars. West Virginia's media market is a fraction of that. Um, you know, so if you look at what it would take to actually change the course of this election, it's, I think it's a much safer investment. It would be a big mistake not to throw some resources out of West Virginia. You know, we're going to do all we can to get folks to, uh, to realize that. Um, but, you know, when you talk to voters, I mean, I'm, when you talk to the uh, these uh, so-called experts in D.C. or whatever, you know, the, uh, they are quick to oversimplify West Virginia, and they think it's just a, a deeply red state now. And I think that's a little bit of a mistake. I think, I think voters got frustrated with Democrats, and they're giving Republicans a chance. They definitely like former President Trump. But, uh, but I don't see that the electorate is entirely lined up along all the things Republican Party cares about, especially when you talk to women. Uh, they don't like that uh, women in West Virginia lost their – a re- a reproductive rights they had for 50 years. A lot of women in the state are not happy about that, and that's going to have a pushback effect as well. Um, and there's a, uh, so this race, it's a mistake to just oversimplify is the only argument that I'm trying to make. And you know, um, you know, I, I think if people look at this, and you know, ho- hopefully our polling will suggest this. Uh, there is a much better chance for me to win this uh, race than anyone I thought. You know, I mean, three or four months ago. I'm not suggesting we're up today, Bill. I, I know we have work to do, uh, but if you look at the trend lines, the governor's uh, popularity has not been going up over the last couple of months. He, he's taken a, uh, uh, some serious damage to his reputation, and it's just on us to continue reminding people exactly who he is. Glenn Elliott is our guest here on the program. He's the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate. Did you have a follow-up on yeah, that, Yeah, I was going, uh, shifting gears. I know we have a lot of problems uh, in front of us as a state, uh, Glenn. Uh, education is certainly one of them. What, would, what approach would you take to the education, especially the, uh, our uh, elementary, secondary schools? Uh, certainly. You know, education is one of those issues that comes up in town hall after town hall where we've been having. Now, as a U.S. senator, uh, you know, I wouldn't be in a direct position to, uh, you know, oversee our schools. I have thoughts on on the what, on our approach. Like, for example, I don't think the HOPE scholarship has been achieved the success that it was intended to, and I think it's actually diverting money from public schools where we have a lot of needs. You know, uh, some counties, I was up in Hampshire a couple, uh, uh, three or four weeks ago uh, where kids are being bused. Uh, two hours each way to school because they only have uh, because of consolidation they only have one school uh i mean that to me is a disaster of an approach for kids you know going through all the difficulties of uh, of the teenage years spending four hours a day on a bus uh, to me seems insane and you know it seems to be a failure and when the governor talks about having surpluses it's almost offensive to me that we haven't made education more of a priority Uh, look you can always spend money um you know 
you can always direct uh, government resources at someone's life over the course of their life. Uh, you can do it early on with, with access to child care, uh, you know, early education, strong schools, or you can spend money later on, often in the form of incarceration, right? So oh, we do not make uh, spending money early in people's lives enough of a, a priority in West Virginia. Um, and that's something that, if elected to the U.S. Senate, you know, I would certainly want to help make sure that, uh, you know, families starting out, you know, kids are starting out with all the tools. Uh, you know, I'd like to see the child tax care credit uh, restored. It was instituted during COVID. It was let to expire I would vote to extend that. That took a lot of children in West Virginia out of poverty. Um, but beyond that, there's a lot of things you've got to do. You have to make investments in people's lives early on so you don't have to see the consequences of failure later. And I think sometimes we get that backwards. Glenn, I have two minutes left here. And here's what this kind of comes down to. Sure. And again, a reminder, just two minutes left. If people want to vote for you in West Virginia, the fear is that if – Trump wins, a Democratic Senate would stop him yep. from accomplishing what he wants. If he loses, yep. the bigger fear is that the Harris campaign, the Harris uh, uh, presidency, would bring in more liberalism and more radical left-wing politics. The state doesn't want that. Sure. And that's what, uh, look, if the governor runs any campaign against me, it's always going to call me a radical this, radical that. That's what Republicans do these days. Look at my record as mayor. Uh, you know, I accepted invitations to go to the White House from both the Trump and the Biden administrations. Um, you know, I can work with either. Uh, but I learned a lesson a long time ago from Senator Byrd, and that when you're sent to the Senate on behalf of West Virginians, you represent them first, uh, not any president. Uh, Byrd, oh, and I work for Byrd. Uh, President Clinton was in office, and Byrd was probably the biggest thorn in Clinton's side inside the Senate. He did not always go along with what Clinton wanted, and that to me is the model of being a senator. You don't take directions from your president. Uh, look, I align with the Democratic Party because I've always believed in you know helping the working class and, and looking out for the underdog. It doesn't mean I line up with everything the Harris Walls tickets uh, talking about. It doesn't mean that I would vote against West Virginia's interests just to play some party game. Um, I think I have a record as mayor of Wheeling, which is a moderate record. And I certainly think if elected to the Senate uh, that I would know better. Uh, you know, I know our people pretty well here after this last tour, talking to people everywhere. We have a lot of needs. And, you know, I think West Virginia, uh, you know, we've paid a big price for being, you know, one of the nation's primary sources of power for so many years. Uh, we need to be made whole here going forward. And, you know, it, it's important we have a, a senator willing to fight for West Virginia, not just going to do whatever his or her president uh, tells him to do. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to disagree with my president. Um, you know, I disagree with the Biden administration strongly when they let the Cleveland Cliffs plant uh, close down because of – of uh, the International Trade Corp uh, Commission decision that they could have overturned. I think they should have overturned it. They didn't. I spoke out of, against them. I don't think you find a single instance where Governor Justice has said anything critical of former President Trump because he won't. He's afraid to. I'm not. And on that note, I thank you very much for your time this morning, Glenn. I appreciate it, and we look forward to having you on the program again before Election Day. Hey, thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Glenn. Always All good right. talk to you. All right. Glenn Elliott, Democratic candidate for the U.S. Senate. And